Welcome to Live from HCIC 2023, a podcast series bringing you front row insights from the industry's brightest minds. In this 12-part series, we delve into the heart of the trends impacting health systems with leading experts, senior executives, and thought leaders, as recorded live at the Healthcare Internet Conference in November of 2023. This series is brought to you by Greystone, Bowstring Media, and Touchpoint Media. Listen in as we hear from our industry leaders on the latest innovative strategies and efforts that are shaping our space. So I'm sitting here with Dan Dunlop, uh, one of the 2023 inductees to the Healthcare Internet Hall of Fame. I was honored to present you an award uh, at the Healthcare Internet Conference this year. Dan, you've been a long-term time friend of mine as well. I'm so excited to be uh, sitting down and chatting with you. It's great to be here, Chris, and, uh, and that was really special last night. And it was special having you be the one presenting the award yeah. and handing it to me and being up there on stage with me. And I do want people to know that one of the best meals I've ever had in my life was with Chris in Boston <laughs> at Myers and Chang. It was incredible. So yeah. uh, we that, were reminiscing about that idea. Reminiscing last night. That was a good point. But you know, Dan, some people um, watching and listening in may not know about you. Why don't you share a little bit about yourself so people that may not know you can be familiar with you? Sure. I'm an Aries. I love cats. Walks on the beach. <laughs> I'm married to Scotty Arwood, who's an amazing woman who has put up with me. Scotty claims she's a, a blog widow. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that speaks to my life as a healthcare marketer and blogger and social media person. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm a healthcare marketer. I'm, I'm a strategist and um, I love content marketing. And, yeah. I, and I think I was talking to Ahava Lieb, Liebtag, who yeah. you know. And Ahava and I, I think we're, we're like original content marketers, yeah. as are you, Chris. Okay. You know, we've just been doing it before it was a thing. Before it was called yeah. content marketing. Yeah. Right? I run a small marketing firm and mm-hmm. I think a very small, powerful marketing firm in North Carolina called Jennings. Mm-hmm. And um, we do marketing for healthcare uh, firms, not just hospitals and health systems, but other organizations around the country. Right, right. But I mean, I I've became familiar with you with your focus on the healthcare industry and the healthcare yep. space. And what's interesting, Dan, is that um, this year, and this is what you mentioned when you were on stage yesterday, right? It's it, it, you kind of taken a little bit of shift in the approach that we're taking because content marketing, it seems so clinical and dry and like it's even like, you know, a, a, a discipline of marketers. But tell us a little bit about your new positioning. Yeah, it's interesting how positioning comes into play in what we do. Yeah. And, I, and I've watched you, Chris, over your career, you know, shift <laughs> positioning over the years. And, mm-hmm. and I, I always think about What's important to me? What do I want to be talking about now? And um, recently I've had several things happen to me and around me that really have made me question what's important. What, what do I want to be talking about in this last third of my healthcare marketing career? And I, I am in the last third of my career wow. for better or worse. And um, I, I really think as I look at our industry, mm-hmm. our clients come to me more and more Really, the predominant request is, how can we improve recruitment and retention? Right. We're losing people right and left. And as I look at these organizations, you know, we are the hospital and healthcare industry, and we're old school. Yeah. You know, we are the the white male American business model, corporate America. And you would think in healthcare, we're this soft, nurturing, loving industry, but we're not. We're not. We walk down, and Chris, I know you've done this. I've walked down these halls in the hospitals where they have all the board members' photos on the wall and CEO photos on the wall, and they're all these old white guys. And and often they're black and white photos too, which just makes it even even, even more old school feeling. But, but they all come from this corporate background, uh-huh. and understandably so. And, and it's never been about the patient, believe it or not, in healthcare. Yeah. It, it, it's sad. And it's certainly not about the employees. So, of course, you have a problem with retention, you know? Yeah. And, and our language and our culture evolved from the culture of warfare and yeah. the language of warfare. And I've written about this, blogged about it, and done podcasts. But it really is the, the language of warfare, strategy, tactics, you name it, right. you know? My lieutenants, Chris Boyer, my <laughs> lieutenant here. You know how to deal with leakage. Yeah, or let's go. <laughs> let's go in the war room. Yes, and yeah. Even my marketing firm, mm. we used to have war rooms for different campaigns we That's would true. do, and you go in, and the walls would be plastered with stuff. So it's this culture 
this old culture which began with the language of warfare. And it's not a warm thing. It's not embracing. It's not nurturing. And and it's so odd to me that we can have businesses like Subaru, a car company, mm-hmm. who built their brand around love. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And consider we are, like we, we talk about, a lot of us are driven to this industry because we're purpose driven, right? Yeah. We want to help. We yeah. We want to make health better. And yet we we don't that's not our native language. Yeah, we're we're into the mission of it and yet and yet we're set in this corporate environment and and I know a lot of people when I'm talking about this at you know, conferences, I know they're thinking, how am I going to go to my CEO and tell him we need to embrace a language of love when we're dealing with our employees, you know? Yeah. That's exactly the problem. If you can't see that, if you can't imagine it, then something's wrong with your culture as an organization. If you want to keep employees and you want to attract employees, you need to love and nurture your current employees right. and create that kind of environment where people want to be. Everybody's offering a $20,000 signing bonus for nurses. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. people are paying doctors, you know, as much money as they possibly can, and the next guy's outbidding them and it's going back and forth. It's ridiculous. It's not about money. Right. It's not about benefits. It's about caring and nurturing. And of all things, healthcare organizations should know how to do this. So I've been going around the country preaching about our need to make this transformation. That really is my positioning. And people say, you know, the healthcare marketers say, well, what can I do? Right. Because, you know, I'm just the healthcare marketing person or right. I'm the strategist. But there are things we can do, you know, the way we can celebrate through our campaigns, through internal branding campaigns. And by the way, I think when it comes to marketing today, we don't put enough emphasis on marketing, on branding, on branding and and internal branding in particular. Yeah, exactly. We need to take and celebrate our employees. Right. So create a campaign that celebrates your people. Right. Right. I love that. I love that. And I'm even as you're saying that I'm struck by the fact that we're calling it a campaign. Which does sound militaristic. It's another military term. Right, exactly. Exactly. But I see what you're saying, right, about bringing this kind of language of love and do it in an authentic way. Yes. I, you know, I've been in a lot of, uh, you know, boardrooms with HR people where we're trying to brainstorm about our brand characteristics and all that. And inevitably they say we build this culture of unity and love. But it sometimes it's it's a lot of I I don't know what the right word is. Right. It's like a. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. thank you. (laughs) That's that's a much cleaner term than what I would have used. But it does seem like it's yeah. inauthentic, right? Yeah. So and and so tell us a little bit about like how you would work with organizations. Because I know this is what you're doing, right? You're talking with organizations. How do you do that? You have to get the executive team, the leadership team to sign off on this. Mm-hmm. You know, if they don't believe it, they need to be dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but, you know, they're old school yeah. and they need to move on. But yeah. you need to bring your t- your leadership team along because, again, you, you mentioned earlier, Chris, it has to be authentic. Yeah, It can't just be all of a sudden we're, we're this loving organization mm-hmm. when yesterday we were this hierarchical, you know, rule with an iron fist kind of organization. Right. So it starts with recruiting leadership. Who can who can take you in this direction? Right, you know, and that's it's visionary. It's different, yeah. um, and often it's female. And and I, I'm biased, but I you know I love seeing female leadership in healthcare organizations. Mm-hmm. And not to say you know there aren't hierarchical rule with an iron fist women out there too. You're right, right. But but generally, I think I think I've seen women be much more comfortable with this approach. You know, and I was thinking, too, you know, when you look at hospital leadership, which, you know, in and of itself is problematic. Yeah. What do you think about it? And we've we've talked about this in time memoriam uh, about this. But it's oftentimes in health systems you have they, they come from many different disciplines. They either come from uh, a clinical background. They're a physician that has suddenly grown up through mm-hmm. the weeks and suddenly now they're a CEO of a health system or they come from the finance department. Right. They understand the business side of it. Right. And both of those types of people, they tend to be a little bit more hard and, and cool. Yeah. The the ones that come out of nursing, I, I think, are really resonate with me. I agree. And I'm wondering if that's if that comes from the the nature of what nursing is in our industry. What yeah. Thoughts? Yeah. I think I think with nursing you get this wonderful blend uh-huh. of leadership uh-huh. and um, you know, a, a kind of take take action approach. Yeah. But also that kind of nurturing and caring and supporting your team. Right. That sense of teamwork. And, you know, frankly, if you have a CEO who doesn't understand teamwork, you've got a bigger problem. Yeah. 
But I, I just think if you can, I think it, it's like in the early days, Chris, when you and I were doing social media 101 presentations, oh my gosh, yeah. trying to convince hospitals it was time to adopt right. social media. Right. You had to show the ROI. Yeah. You know, you had to show that this isn't just about, you know, saying uh, our CEO Bob had coffee today at Starbucks at 10 a.m. It's about telling a story that actually supports your business objectives. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same way with this language of love approach with, with cultural transformation, selling cultural transformation as a business priority, you know, something that's going to make you a stronger organization. And if ever there's been a time where leadership is going to understand the need for cultural transformation, it's now when they are just trying so hard to recruit these these employees right retain employees yeah our industry is under fire yeah I, again another militaristic term but i mean there's a lot of pressures yeah uh and people are actively leaving our industry because for many reasons yeah. right yeah and and building this kind of culture of love and it sounds very hippieistic when we say that we're hippies I don't but don't mind that though. but no but I, and by the way, it's not lost to me that you actually uh, uh, indicated that there is ROI in love, there right? Is. So there you go. That's actually maybe a new blog post for you. There is. <laughs> it's an article. I, I can see it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But this stems from a lot yeah. of different places, though. But one of the one of the most profound things is a personal experience that you had. Do you, do you mind sharing that with uh, people listening in? Not at all, man. I, I love telling this story. Um, and I've done it a few times. But hey, during the pandemic... Um, what was it? February of 2021. Mm -hmm. I was sitting at my desk in Durham, North Carolina, at my office. And because it was the pandemic, there was nobody there. It's yeah. just me hanging out in this skyscraper in downtown Durham. And um, uh, my left arm went numb. I couldn't move it. And um, it was tingling. And um, and I, I stood up and moved around and was, thought I might be having a heart attack or something. I was and I could tell I didn't have the symptoms of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I thought it must be a stroke. And, and I know about strokes, you know, and I know yeah. time is of the essence. So, so I called an Uber, went, went to, went to Duke Medical Center. <laughs> I mean, I, the good thing was from the time I had the first symptom to the time I got to the medical center was 14 minutes, I believe. Wow. So it was quick, you know, much better than calling an ambulance in my case. But, um, most people I'd say call an ambulance. Yes. But, um, but anyway, I'd had a stroke and I was really fortunate in that there were no lasting, uh, effects of the stroke. Um, and, and it, and it, Pay, it got me to pay attention to some health issues I had. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I had AFib. They diagnosed that as the mm -hmm. cause. And since they've treated it with an ablation. But this this health scare, and it truly was a scare, um, really gave me the opportunity to be a patient. And I've gotten to go... So so there are a number of things related to this. One, it, show, it showed me life is short and frail. Right. And don't take for granted the people around you, your coworkers, um, in the case of a hospital, you know, your colleagues, nurture them, love them, don't take them for granted. And that's what got me on this um, language of love kick, really. Mm -hmm. um, but also it, it, it made me focus a lot more on the patient experience because suddenly I was a patient and I was in the hospital and in medical clinics a lot. You know, I, I had all kinds of appointments with sure. neurologists, cardiologists, you name it. And um, one of the things that drives me crazy right now is we have all this incredible technology and I'm so excited about it. Like I love my chart. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know a lot of people who say that, but I love my chart. Right. I love being able to go in, look at my test results, see where all, my whole slew of I whole team of physicians now mm -hmm. reach out and message them. Yeah. You know, there's all this great stuff, but the failings are even more apparent than the good stuff. Oh, wow. And, you know, for every medical appointment I have, mm -hmm. there there comes an email saying, Dan, please check in and do this stuff online before your appointment. So I go into my chart. I fill out. I, I'm diligent about it. I fill out all the paper, of course, course. the medical history. And why they ask me for the medical history every time when it's already in my chart, I don't know, but I do it. I update it. And... um I, I get to the appointment and I have to do it again in paper. And I spend all this time filling out all this paperwork after I've taken the time to check in in advance. You know, and, and then half the time you can't cancel or change an appointment through my chart. At least I can. You have to call. You have someone. to call. Why do I have to call? Yeah. 
Yeah. It's ridiculous. And yeah. sometimes you can't message a physician through my chart, depending on the physician right. and their department. And then sometimes they don't read their messages in my chart or at least never respond to them. Right. I remember I got COVID at one point and I was messaging my primary care provider, who will go nameless here, <laughs> and I could not get her attention. So finally, I messaged my cardiologist, who I know has a great nurse, her name yeah. is Kim, and she checks all his messages and makes sure you get a response. Mm -hmm. Kim took care of it, and they reached out to my primary care provider and said, hey, Dan needs some attention here. You know, he has a heart condition. Could you please help him? Right. But it's like, you know, there is so much promise in this technology. Right. And it's so exciting, and I embrace it fully, but yet it's failing me at every turn. Yeah, and it doesn't really speak to the getting back to the theme of today's conversation, that language of love, right? I feel because because if you if you disconnect the experience as a patient, um, what you're actually showing is that maybe the patient is not prioritized as important in all of this, right? Yeah. And so and these little things that you're kind of outlining are so profound that it could lead, unlike you, I know you're very diligent and you follow yeah. your doctor's orders. And you have a great cardiologist, which I think is wonderful. Absolutely. But you know, um, you know, not all of us in this industry are like, you know, have these horrible experiences that allow us to actually intimately understand the patient experience. And I think that that, if we can walk a mile in our patient's shoes sometimes, it really helps a lot. I myself have, you know, a chronic condition, type 1 diabetic. Mm -hmm. I see my endocrinologist and over the last two years, we moved to more of a, you know, like a, a new pump and a glucometer and there, and, and she has been nothing but attentive to me throughout all of this. And even to the point where she went to the mats to kind of try to, um, you know, help me negotiate through my insurance company, the coverage of these. Oh, products, wow. Right. And I'm like, those things matter so much to me. Yet those are the little things that we often overlook. And so yeah. as healthcare marketers, as you know, we're getting close to the end of the conversation yeah. here, but I'd, I'd love for you to, you know, like share in part some of your wisdom. I know you have a great blog post people can go see but yeah. and, and go read, and which we will encourage you to do. Sure. We'll put the links in the show notes and all that. But what kind of tips, what, what are some things that you would share with people as they start to maybe embrace this culture and language of love as you described? I think, I think you hit on it, Chris, when you said embrace the little things. Yeah. You know, it's, we, we all get so caught up in these big initiatives and, and we have these grandiose ideas about what we can do, yeah. you know, both with our marketing and with marketing technology. When, when, Right now, it would be great to button up the little things that need buttoning up. One of, one of my most horrific memories from my recent healthcare experiences was right after my stroke, having a follow-up appointment with my cardiologist. And, and you know how they bring you in the exam room and leave you there yeah. while you're waiting for the doctor to come. And, and I was sitting in there, and, I'm, and I always study the environment. I was looking at the wall, and there's a sign on the back of the door that says, um, this room was last cleaned. And it was a year ago. Oh, my gosh. You know, as, but why have that sign there? I would just yeah. take the sign down and like, down. live up to that. And then there was an old glove on the floor. I don't know. You know, and some tissue paper. That, and I was like, okay, this room probably really hasn't been cleaned in a year. Wow. But, but it's those little things. That's just right. one example of, you know, help your team see the practice from the patient's Stampled, you know, mm -hmm. you know, often a physician never walks in the front door of a practice. Yeah. They come in the back door every day. Right. Same thing with the nursing staff. Have them come in that front door. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. And it's, and it bringing it back to the theme of love. Yes. I think about this in personal relationships, right? We always say it's the little things that matter the most when it comes to the patient experience, when it comes to your employee experience, it's the little things that yeah. matter the most, right, Dan? Yeah, and we and we forget our spouses. We forget yeah. to be attentive sometimes, yeah, yeah, and to do those special little things that make them feel feel special. And it's not pizza. Yeah, it's not buying them a pizza. Right. You know, it, it's other thing. Right. It's really spending time with them. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow, Dan, I am so glad. Oh, thank you. You know, I'm glad that we've had a chance to catch up here at the conference. Well deserved in your award thank around you. the Healthcare thank Internet you. Hall of Fame, most innovative individual. Um, I look forward to reading your blogs keep reading your blogs as we go thank you and i you know i just think that we need more of people like you helping to kind of shape and innovate our industry more so thank you for your time today thank you for yours chris thank you for watching live from hcic 2023 we hope these insights have sparked new ideas and conversations 
A special thanks to the industry experts featured on our show, and to Greystone, Bowstring Media, and Touchpoint Media for making these discussions available. For more episodes and exclusive content, please visit greystone.net, touchpoint.health, or subscribe through your favorite podcast listening platform. If you want to be part of more conversations like this one, please make sure to attend the Healthcare Internet Conference in Austin, Texas. You can find more details at hcic.net.